Hey guys, it's been a while since I've made a video and that's because I've just been so busy with things, you know, teaching and moving and um, just managing all the stuff that I've gotten myself into. But I should be able to get back into making videos like normal, at least relatively normal, because uh, the next month or so school will be closing down for the school year and then I'll have some time over summer break. But at least now I'm able to uh, record some stuff because I finally got moved in and got at least some books organized. I'm still looking at a bunch that need to be need to be figured out. But anyway, so this video is going to be just uh, some books I've gotten a hold of in the last few months, and uh, maybe just a little bit why I got them or how I got them, and uh, maybe some recommendations too in there. So. Um, well, I just kind of have a haphazardly collected stack, but I think I will uh, just start with what was on the top. So first here I have Bathhouse by Hans Henny Jan. And um, I actually came across this because of uh, uh, Jacob Seifring, you know, the translator. Uh, he was giving it away on... Uh, you know, he mentioned on Twitter, he's, he's giving it away. Whoever responds gets it. I happened to <laughs> hop on Twitter at the right time and, and he ended up sending it to me. So thanks to him for this. Um, I don't have any other Hans and Jan, but I know quite a few people who really like his work. So I figured this would be as good as time as any to get a feeling for what he writes like. So that is a chat book. It was published by Solar Luxuriance, that's translated by Adam Siegel. So, it's kind of a nice little book here. If you want to read it, you can pause there. And then, a book I am just absolutely thrilled that it finally came out. So, um, Contramundum Press is one of my absolute favorite presses right now. And they just put out Literature and Politics, Selected Writings by Robert Musso, and uh, translated by, I think it's Janice Grill. Janice, I think so, right there. And so what this is, is a selection of, some of them are essays that have already been published. Like, for example, uh, if you have, um, not gesture and speech, what is it? Oh yeah, Precision and Soul, uh, Essays and Addresses, um, which I have that, so I've already read some of the stuff in here, but uh, then there are there is some stuff from his diaries as well. But there's also stuff from his uh, Naklas, which I'm not sure I'm saying that right, but um, his kind of uh, unpublished writings. And then also something that's really awesome is um, an introduction by Klaus Amann. And it's about 200 pages of an introduction before his actual, Musel's actual texts uh, enter the picture. It heavily quotes from his text, so it's definitely justified. But uh, after that introduction, you have about what, 230 pages of Musel's own writings. And then you get, of course, notes and end notes and so on. But uh, it's fascinating. Already in the introduction, the translator's introduction by Janice Grill, it's just fascinating. It's exactly like what needs to be said about our time. Uh, very, very wise and thoughtful way. And then I've already learned some fascinating stuff in this Klaus Amann introduction. Like, for example, Musel was corresponding with Tony Kassirer, Ernst Kassirer's wife, uh, in the early 30s. I would assume he was talking with Kassirer as well, but that's just perfect to know. Um, also, uh, in the early 30s, Musel was invited to France to speak against the, you know, 
Nazi fascist specter that was looming over all of Europe. But of course, in France, they were hoping he would um, back communism as an alternative, and he also talked against that, and he was heckled off stage. Other dissidents similar to Musso included uh, Simone Weil and André Gide, so he was in good company. Um, what else? Oh, Klaus Amann also mentions uh, the interest that Ingeborg Bachmann had in Robert Musso in the 50s during the Cold War. And uh, it's just fascinating. I mean, M Musso is the writer for our time, truly. But uh, anyway, this translator also translated theater symptoms, which is a selection of uh, Musso's dramatic writing and also his criticism of drama and that was just published last year so if you haven't gotten either of those and if you don't just like hate watch my videos which i'm sure there are some people out there but yes definitely top of your list top of your list oh also that uh collection uh what is it, Notes of a Non-Political Man or something like that. Uh, the Thomas Mann collection that was just published by NYRB Classics. Apparently, uh, Musil uh, read that and thought a lot about it while he was writing some of his later ideas on politics. So it might be an interesting companion volume. All right. Next, I have kind of a, a series in a way um, in the Discord that's associated with my channel, which um, if you want to talk to smart people about books, there are some smart people in there. Um, and somebody brought up John Ruskin. And uh, I had looked into John Ruskin before because... Um, I knew Thomas Carlyle was influential for Thomas uh, John Ruskin, and also Proust, on the other end, loved Ruskin as an influence. So I had read a little bit of his stuff before, but it never really struck me. I've, I've had a real difficult time trying to get into the Victorians, because uh, I always think of them in contrast to the Americans of the time, and it just, no, no contest, really. Um, and in the last year or so, I've been trying to get into Victorians that are higher quality than the average one you would see, maybe. The poets are different. I kind of categorize the poets differently. Uh, Robert Browning is just absolutely top tier. Um, Tennyson is interesting. I would say he's not quite as good as uh, Robert Browning as a whole, but, you know, good stuff. And then uh, George Eliot, of course, uh, fascinating writer. Um, I haven't read Middlemarch yet, but it's high on my list. Um, also, um, his name is blanking. The Ordeal of Richard Feverell, The Egoist, uh, George Meredith. George Meredith is the other writer that's fascinating um, of the Victorians. I can't get into Dickens, honestly. I've tried to read Dickens multiple times, and he, he beats you over the head with the information over and over and over and i just don't like that style of writing jane austen does the same thing uh, and trollop and whoever else i'm just like whatever but that being said so john ruskin born the same year as melville 1819 and you know heavily influential in um art history and as an art theorist. He was the first uh, professor of art history at Oxford. And the first thing that I got into just recently is Unto This Last. And that's his famous critique of a Victorian political economy, how they would have said it, economics in our days, how it would be said. But 
was heavily influential. And uh, in my classes, my junior classes, we just got done reading a couple months ago, uh, The Great Gatsby. And I decided to take an economics angle, apart from the obvious, you know, close reading and looking at symbols and character and so on. But I had my students read some economics articles. We weren't able to quite do as much as I wanted, but um, I was able to finagle in some uh, Gabriel Zuckman and uh, Piketty and um, Emmanuel Sines. Also, uh, Henry George, uh, a speech by Henry George, The Crime of Poverty. Um, I was going to balance it out with The Gospel of Wealth by Andrew Carnegie. I was going to balance out the George. And then um, I wasn't really planning on balancing out the, the stuff by the, the th three Frenchmen because as far as I can tell, that's pretty much exactly what we need to be hearing now because we have similar levels of wealth inequality to when the, uh, just previous to the Great Depression. And I think that needs to be talked about. But anyway, so this, unto this last, really just came up at the right moment. So thanks to the Discord for bringing this up again. And then... A couple weeks ago, I was talking with um, another friend, and he's doing a reread of Proust. And that got me thinking about myself wanting to go back and read Proust. So I've been picking it up here and there. Uh, it's on my, my favorite shelf, and um, it's just so wonderful. And I know that Proust loved Ruskin, and I can only imagine that one of the things he loved most, I mean, I'm sure he loved all of his writing, but one of the things he loved most must have been Praeterita, his, uh, Ruskin's autobiography. Just the way it's described is fascinating, and just what I've sampled so far, it's just perfect for what I need right now. And then, connected to that, the other day, along with getting my Robert Musil, I also got a book I had been wanting for a long time that I just never got a hold of, but had been interested in for a while. And that is John Henry Newman's, Cardinal Newman's, Apologia Pro Sua Vita. Oh, Apologia Pro Vita Sua. There we go. Which um, came before the Praeterita, if I remember correctly. Let me see. What are the dates? Yeah, appeared in 1864. It's the John Henry Newman. And then Praeterita came in the 70s, 1870s. Let's see. Oh, 1885. Okay, so a little later. But it does mention 1870s, so that must be what I thought. Okay, so yeah, definitely 20 years later and it definitely influenced him. So anyway, two fascinating Victorian uh, intellectual autobiographies, spiritual autobiographies. And I know that Joyce also loved John Henry Newman. So that's also one of the things that kept it on the top of my mind. So loving those. And then lastly, I have another video I wanna make. Um, I actually met Mircea Cartarescu like last week and I want to make a special video for that. But um, with that being said, I was also fortunate enough to meet briefly Will Evans, the, the guy who runs Deep Vellum and who also managed the acquisition of Dalkey Archive, keeping that one alive. So I uh, sincerely thanked him for his efforts for world literature. But one of the books I have been so looking forward to is finally out. And I want to plead everyone who watches this video, if you haven't already bought it, as soon as you quit watching this video out of <laughs> indignation or just the video runs out, 
buy this book, buy multiple copies. We need to make sure books like this keep getting translated and printed, okay? So anyway, that book is, if you don't already guess, The Garden of the Seven Twilights by Mikhail de Palol, a translation from Catalan by Adrian Nathan West. An amazing, an amazing situation that we have this translated. So the first time I ever heard about this book, should be no surprise, was from Andre of the Untranslated, who also reviewed, um, maybe six years ago now, El Troy Accord, which just sounds unbelievably interesting and complex and beautiful. But that book came out um, after, originally in Catalan, came out after The Garden of the Seven Twilights. So Garden of Seven Twilights was originally published in 1989. And just to give you a little description of the book, of course, you can look it up and also check out Andre's review. But um, I think this is, this is a nice provocative uh, cover quote. This says, a Borgesian apocalyptic Decameron that begins in bombed out Barcelona. Nice. And of course, published by Dalkey Archive, I'm going to read the back at all there. I can't remember if I showed it yet, but feel free to pause there and read the back. But So it starts out during uh, the year 2025 is when the story takes place. But it also begins with a note that is written in the 2900s after the Fourth War of Entertainment. And the book ostensibly takes place during the year 2025, which is during the first War of Entertainment. And they're called War of Entertainment because nuclear deterrence um, has gotten so effective that even if a nuclear war happens, there will only be acceptable but regrettable losses, you know, like something out of Dr. Strangelove. So this nuclear war takes place because they know it won't end the world which lowers the threshold for nuclear war, which removes the idea of mutually assured destruction and makes nuclear war much more likely, which we might be getting into ourselves. But nonetheless, so this book takes place in a, you know, a castle outside of Barcelona, and it's just unbelievable. I've, I've been able to read the first little bit of it about 50 or so pages in, and I'm just loving it so much. I mean, Mikhail de Palol started as a poet, and he's just an excellent writer and even comes through in translation. Obviously, Adrian Nathan West is an awesome translator, one of our best we have. And if you need a reminder of some stuff he's translated, he recently translated um, Hermann Berger's Brenner, which was one of the best books from last year. And then he also translated another Hermann Berger, the Tractatus Logico Suicidalis, which was put out by Wakefield Press. So, which this is, this is Hermann Berger's suicide note, uh, basically. It was found when he killed himself in 1989. Oh, interesting, interesting year. All right, but anyway, that's what I wanted to uh, talk about for this one. A little, little bit longer than I thought I was gonna go, but Anyway, after watching this, I implore anyone watching, support these two presses, Contramundum and Dalkey Archive. Deep Vellum is included in this, but if we want El Troy Accord to be translated, we have to buy this and support it. So. Buy copies for your friends, buy copies for your parents, uh, even if you know they won't read it. Even if you know you won't read it. But uh, anyway, okay. Hopefully you enjoyed, hopefully you got some ideas. Let me know if you've read any of these and if you have any recommendations for similar books, any Victorian intellectual autobiographies that are lesser known, that'd be awesome. So, uh, Carturescu video coming up. Not sure how long it'll take me to make because I want to get it perfect, but it was just truly like 
one of the best days of my life, being able to uh, see Kartrescu talk. So, all right, death is a gang boss.